went 200.4 miles an hour. Right behind Hogan is the car of Emerson Fittipaldi, which, like Hansen Jr., has just recently been left. Emerson, I think we all thought, was a very heavy favorite, but so far, the card seemed to have been dealt more to his younger teammate, Kevin Kogan. Not a heavy favorite, but a strong contender, just to clarify that for yeah. a moment. Here's the comparison, which will show the gap between Mears and not that car, but this car, the car of Kevin Kogan. The lead is 5.8 seconds right at this moment. Then there is the Fittipaldi car, which has been lapped. Then you find the car of number 18, Michael Andretti, who had been very fast, but had a very slow pit stop during the last sequence. And then car number three, Bobby Rahal, and we're going to learn now exactly what he's got. Behind the story of the success of Kevin Kogan lies uh, a story surrounding a man named Tony Sicali, who was the aerodynamicist on Mario Andretti's car last year, the car that finished second and was so competitive throughout. Uh, this year, he moved, uh, switched teams, and is now in Kevin Kogan's pit, masterminding things. And you see Kevin Kogan start to run very well. So the drivers are a factor, yes. The pit crews are a factor, yes. But then so are these engineers who lurk in the background. Let's go down now to Larry Newber. Larry? Larry Curry and crew, that's the crew chief for Kevin Kogan. They stopped on lap 135. Listen to this. They say they need only one more pit stop, and they believe there are some other top teams running in the top five that have to stop at least two more times. How about it, everybody? Well, I think that Rick Mears is anticipating only one more pit stop, and at that time, it is his crew's plan to put on the tires he used on qualifying day, the tires on which the car went nearly 117 miles per hour. So it'll be interesting to see what happens with the number four car then. Let's go to Jackaroo. Well, Jim Lampley, it's going to be liar's poker time in just a few laps. Both Roger Penske and the rest of the crew here say they're only going to go for one stop as well. And as you alluded to, they picked out their proper tires to go the last few miles here in the Indianapolis 500. All right. Thank you very much, Jackaroo. So there you have the confrontation between the pit crews and their strategic imperatives at this moment. For the moment, Sam Posey, this looks like the Rick Mears of the first 100 miles. This is what we were expecting. So it just shows that the problem he had was momentary, and he had a little racing luck to get the yellow flag to come out at just about the right moment. Let's look at that gap and see if it is uh, increasing. It's definitely increasing uh, substantially. Here comes Kogan having lost almost five seconds in the last couple of laps. So Kogan dropping back, Mears pulling away. Well, the Patrick people aren't going to watch that indefinitely without trying to do something about it. So for the moment, their hands are tied. They will have to hope for another yellow flag to give them a chance to pit without losing too much ground. Right yeah. now, Rick Mears has command of the race. This is when you feel helpless. As you said, uh, Jim, they want to do something in the Patrick team for Kevin, but they can't, obviously. Let's go down to Al Troutwig. Al? Well, Sam, just to complete the pit stop strategy for the top trio in this race right now, Michael Andretti's crew chief, Barry Green, said to me, we need a pit stop and a half. What that means is he needs a little luck down the stretch of this race that perhaps will save a little fuel in his car. But right now, he's leaning towards the second pit stop. Back to you. Second pit stop at this point, if both of the other two cars are able to go on only one, would be fatal to Andretti's chances to win the race. Of course, he could go by on, go with only one pit stop if he turned down the boost on the turbocharger, but that would mean less power. Okay, one on the right side of the screen means you're a lap down. So there are only four cars on the lead lap. Mears, Hogan, Andretti, and of course the number four car belonging to Bobby Rahal. Then you saw the other two, which were Unsu Jr. and Fittipaldi. Roberto Guerrero moving up among the leaders again. He's been second and third before. Johnny Rutherford is in eighth place, as you saw the leaders one through 12. Also, we saw Randy Lanier mentioned there. He's the highest place rookie at the moment, driving the kind of race that a rookie typically drives, which is cautious. Yes, but it will be quite a feather in Randy Lanier's cap. He finishes, and particularly if he is named Rookie of the Year, which is somewhat of a coveted honor here. Among the many subjects we discussed before the race with Rick Mears, another had to do with the interaction between the three racing teams that Penske in effect puts on the track. This is what Rick told us about cooperation between his crew and those of Sullivan and Unsu Senior. Never really had anything done in this in this team that's you know in one garage that the other garage doesn't know about. You know it, it's it goes right through you know all the way through the line. That's uh, 
Um, I mean, that's why this team operates the way it does. That's the way it, it's done. And, uh, and it's an advantage. You know, you've got, uh, you know, two or three heads are better than one. Uh, one can work one direction, one can work another, and whichever one seems to be the best, then, you know, and you just pick things up with each one and put them together. And uh, you just seem to get there a little quicker that way. So, you know, we work very, very hard together all the way through until the green flag drops. And then it's, you know, it's every man for himself. We race against each other just as hard. But um, that's what, uh, you know, there are a lot of drivers that, uh, you know, that, that possibly would not be on this team because they wouldn't work that way. Um, that's, I think I've heard Roger say that that's one of the things he looks for when he's looking for a driver as a team player. Because, you know, why should he have one car, if he's got three cars in a race, why should he only have one car with a shot of winning it? And just as he says that, you see him going by Danny Sullivan once again. What are his two teammates? Well, Sullivan has not been competitive since the very start of the race. And Al Unser Sr. in the Penske PC-15 with the Chevrolet engine hasn't been much of a factor either. Again, we look at the situation through the eyes of Danny Sullivan with our ABC Sports race cam. You can see Rick Mears pulling away. In fact, Rick Mears passed uh, Al Unser Sr. just moments before he passed Danny Sullivan. So all three Penske cars, the point is, they're running reliably. They're all still in the race, but only one of them has a realistic chance to win it, and that is the car of Rick Mears. Now we're about 12 laps away from the critical pit stop sequence in the race. Let's go down to Larry Newber. Well, the chess game continues. Now the crew down here in Kevin Cogan's pit feels that Rick Mears has turned up the boost and is trying to get as much distance between himself and Kevin because they think still that Mears and Penske have to make one more stop. Nothing is wrong with Kevin's car. There has been very little communication on the radio between Larry Curry and Kevin Cogan. Larry told me personally that Kevin is running his own race. We are exactly where we want to be and at the speed that we want to be right now in this race. But at the moment, that speed is not sufficient to handle Rick Mears. As Mears has once again assumed command of the Indianapolis 500, has a lead of more than 11 seconds over Kevin Cogan with less than a quarter of the race still left to go. We'll be back with more of the drama right after this. The stars are going to twinkle and shine. How oh, they'll shine. Once again, Rick Mears remains the leader, but now the man who has been his most persistent pursuer throughout the race, Bobby Rahal, has moved back ahead of Kevin Cogan into second place. Here is how it happened just moments before we came back. Rahal in the red car, Cogan on the left, tied up behind traffic. Yes, as so often has happened during the day, it was a traffic situation which triggered the opportunity for the pursuing car to make the pass. You see Ray Hall darting from side to side, deciding which his best shot is, and giving Kevin Kogan plenty of running room because he knows that Kevin is going to pull out wide around the car he has to pass as well. Three abreast down the back straight at about 220 miles an hour, and it's a clear pass for Ray Hall, who now, uh, as he turns in, must turn in from a pinch position. It leaves Kevin Kogan very high in that groove, uh, which he, however, has been able to run successfully up there so far. I think Kevin's car, despite the fact it's not going quite as fast as the two leaders right now, is still, uh, you know, handling beautifully. There's Ray Hall passing Sullivan. Sullivan not having the kind of happy day that he'd like, probably breaking a few hearts in Hollywood. All right. There's a look at him driving the car. Ray Hall, of course, is right behind him. If it looks to you, Jim, as if they're sitting low in that car, and there's Ray Hall pulling out. Now they'll be neck and neck all the way down. That's the back straight. They are sitting low in the car. Danny Sullivan's rear end, as you see Ray Hall just skim by him easily, Danny Sullivan's rear end is actually sitting on the bottom of the inside of the car and the outside of the bottom of the car just a quarter of an inch away is a piece of plywood which wears slowly down as the race proceeds and is actually in contact with the track down at the end of the straight such as the downforce in other words the driver's rear end is scraping along the track how about that that's a secure feeling yeah <laughs> nice huh? there are a lot of secure feelings involved yeah in despite what bobby ray hall says i still think it's uh, a lot easier to be up here than down there well yeah I mean, it's, uh, it's more rational, too. Yeah. Bobby Rahal is the leader, or I should say is in second place. Well ahead of Kogan now, as Kogan has not yet gone past Danny Sullivan. And we believe that there are now about five laps 
prior to what is going to be the critical pit stop sequence of the race. Now, there was Mears coming across the start-finish line. Here comes Ray Hall. Hogan is obscured by the white car. There he comes, Kevin Hogan in third place. You can see exactly there the difference between Rick Mears, Bobby Ray Hall, and then Kevin Hogan on the racetrack. All Fourth right. place still belongs to Michael Andretti, but he is not a factor at this point. All right, here's the gap uh, from Mears back to Ray Hall over the last four laps. It's gone from 11 seconds to 9.7 to 9.9 to 8.8. .8. So, all right, 8.8 .8 as of the last lap. Let's see what happens now. We'll get a clock on them. You see Mears, the race leader, coming down the front straight here at Indianapolis. And we'll see the gap back to Bobby Rahal. The clock is running. Bobby Rahal has now appeared. He's in the center of your screen right now. Remember, 8.8 .8 was last lap. Uh -huh. He's closing He's in. Him. More than one second per lap. Bobby Rahal is slicing off of that lead. Nevertheless, both of them still have to make a pit stop. So the question is going to be exactly how much time is used up and what is done during that pit stop. Only four drivers on the same lap. Michael Andretti is now a full 22 seconds in back of Rick Mears and more to the point, 13 seconds in back of Kevin Kogan. So it's hard to envision Andretti getting back into things now unless something befalls one of the three cars in front of him. Nevertheless, there are three men who still have an excellent chance to win the Indianapolis 500. And there are the messages being transmitted to two of them on pit board. They're also getting that information over the radio from the pit, so they are constantly informed during the race of where they are and what's going on. Pit stops extremely critical coming up within the next three or four laps. The last chance for the lead drivers to get the combination of tires uh, that will carry them to the end. Now, obviously, Rick Mears will talk about the tires that he's going to put on the car as we understand it. They are the tires that he qualified on. Michael Andretti's in already. Those tires will make his car handle, uh, they'll be, it'll be very fast, but it'll be what they call loose, the tail sliding out against the wall a little bit. Rick Mears is going to have his hands full, but he's going to have a very fast car. Mears is going to go another lap, so is Ray Hall. So is Kevin Coke. Michael Andretti in the pits. Chip Ganassi's car there on the upper left being wheeled by. He's out for the day. It's been a safe race so far, Jim, hasn't it? Sneva, Vogler, Parsons all crashed, but nobody uh, hurt at all. I never cease to marvel at the safety level which has evolved within this sport. Rick Mears is planning the pit now as he comes around this time. There he is. Comes through turn four. You'll see the yellow line to his left, and he will pull right down underneath it. Now watch very carefully the clock as Rick Mears pits. He is towards the very front of pit row. In fact, his is number one all the way forward past the start finish line. This is when then. This is when every one of the five men, Jim, who's allowed over the wall to work on the car feels that extraordinary pressure. The race for this moment is literally in their hands, not in Rick Mears' hands. The slightest mistake, look at the man on the left front putting that tire on. If he secures it wrong, then the race is lost. If the fuel hose comes off in the wrong way, the race is lost. It is up to these men in the pits now. This is a long one. No, it's not. For this stage of the race, no. All right, yellow flag. Could this be critical? Mears obviously lost. The others are going to be able to. That's Moreno's stop there. All right, now this is exactly what we talked about, isn't it? You see, Mears was pitting ahead of all the others, and all of a sudden, it's caught up with him. The others will now be able to stop under the yellow. Their stops will cost them much less than half as much as Rick Mears. And Bobby Rahal darting into the picture here. This is the biggest conceivable break for Ray Hall. Mears, who appeared to have things, and you see Kogan at the bottom of your screen coming in. Mears, who appeared to have things going his way. This is where, not luck exactly, although you can see that it is partly luck, but Mears was stopping sooner than anyone else, and that strategy has now backfired. Remember the stops uh, uh, that they have to beat uh, is that 17 seconds of Rick Mears. They are stopping faster, too. The I said it was the race. long at 19 seconds. You disputed me and said not long for that stage of the race. But he lost a good three or four seconds to both Ray Hall and Kogan on the pit stop alone. Plus, of course, the misfortune four years of the yellow flag, which came down just as he was completing his pit stop. If you're a golfer, call it rub of the asphalt. There is Bobby Ray Hall's pit crew 
they should be very satisfied with what they just did if the car is performing well on the racetrack. All right, but remember, his pursuer, Ray Hall's pursuer, will now be Rick Mears with Mears' car set up the way it was in qualifying when he was the fastest car ever to lap the Indianapolis Motor Speedway when he did so at 217 miles an hour. We have 34 laps to go in the Indianapolis 500. Rick Mears remains the leader under the yellow flag, but his lead will be diminished over Bobby Rahal and Kevin Kogan who will be trying to catch him in these next 80 miles. The situation could hardly be more dramatic. We're live at Indianapolis. There are 32 laps remaining in the race. We're still under the yellow, but look at the way they stand. Mears, Rahal, and Kogan are the only cars on the same lap uh, right now the way we have it but they are so close together that it truly is anybody's race the yellow car there number four is Rick Mears and directly behind him number three is Bobby Rahal and behind him very close to him number seven is Kevin Kogan okay they're going to go green now let's go back to Jim and Sam all right thank you very much Jim McKay the green flag comes down the lead has collapsed it is a three-car race to the finish now with 32 laps to go in the Indianapolis 500. Those two cars at the front of your screen are almost lapped. Well, one of them, Pancho Carter, has been. Michael Andretti is almost fully lapped. He is almost a lap down. To the lead car right there, the yellow one, Rick Mears. Bobby Rahal in second place in the red car. The third place car belongs to Kevin Hogan. One of those three men, it appears, at this moment, is going to win the 1986 Indianapolis 500. Obviously, Mears lost that seven and a half second advantage that he had as a result of stopping under the green. But where he was lucky in retrospect, uh, Jim, was that the yellow came out before he had fully completed the pit stop sequence and gotten back up to speed. The other guys dove into the pit. Uh, so in other words, he did not make his entire stop under the green versus the other guy's entire stop under the yellow. And that's why Rick Mears is still the leader of the race. All right, now as Mears tries to stay in front of Rahal, let's go down to Jackaroo. Well, Jim, just as Sam Posey said, the pit stop sequence, the caution in the green, well, it was six, one half dozen another for Roger Penske and Rick Mears. They're very confident. They say, now we can go the distance. We've got plenty of fuel. We've got the right stagger, they think on the rear tires so they feel they're ready to go the distance and when i asked roger about his concern about bobby ray all he said hey you got to be concerned about everybody it's not over as yogi says until it's over indeed if you were watching on may 10 when mears rocketed around this speedway at a four lap average of 216.828 miles per hour you have seen what the car can do with these four tires on it specifically the three tires on the left rear and the right side now let's go to al troutwick Jim, let me tell you first that Steve Horn was not going to bring Bobby Rahal down into the pits until they heard that Rick Mears was coming in. At that moment, the sign for Rahal to read out on the track was changed, and he came in. We've already heard Sam and you talk about the yellow flag caution, and that was really an advantage for Rahal, but a small one. They are cautiously optimistic here in the pits that Ray Hall can catch up to Mears and perhaps make a move. But things were smooth during the pit stop, and they are confident here. Back to you, Jim. All right, thanks very much, Al Troutwick. He was catching up to him in the lap before that pit stop sequence, but now we're talking about two slightly different cars. Yeah, exactly, because you've got to realize, and you see how close Ray Hall is. This is a real horse race, no question about it. Uh, you've got to realize that the cars, they, they, they look the same from moment to moment, but they don't feel the same to the driver because of the adjustments that are possible to make. Right now, as we understand it, there will be, unless there was a yellow, no more pit stops. So the men... At the wheel of these two cars, Mears in the yellow car on the left and Bobby Rahal in the red car on the right, are committed to the setups that they have. Here goes Rahal. He's going to try. No. No. He slips back by. All right. Now we're thinking he spoke to us moments ago when I talked to him on the radio about the turbulence. He is feeling that turbulence off the back of Rick Mears' car now. You won't see him spend too much time right up behind Mears' car. And if he is behind it, he'll be slightly offset to one side like that so that part of his car can still run in clear air. 28 laps to go. That's Michael Andretti, who's just in front of Mears. They may lap him before all is said and done. Into turn one. Now in the south chute. Go around the race course one more time with us. In turn two, Debbie Rahal and Chris Bowen. This is nail-biting time for them. Up to a point, their work is done. Neither man expects to pit again. Down the back straight, Rick Mears leading Bobby Rahal. They go into turn three and around the north side chute. 
again. The shoots are only an eighth of a mile. The turn stretch a quarter of a mile. Now the five eighth of a mile front straight away as they come out of turn four. Here, just in front of Ray Hall, a matter of scant hundreds of a second separating the two of them. Ray Hall goes a little bit to the inside of the track, peeking up the track just past Mears as they go back into turn one. There are 27 laps to go. It looks as though it may be this way all the way down to the wire. And Rick Mears once again involved in a shootout in the last stages of the Indianapolis 500. You think back to 1982 when he battled with Gordon Johncock coming from behind coming up so fast on him and unable to pass right in the last part of the last lap all right what and Colton incidentally is not that far back so it's really three cars and you see him on the extreme right of your screen there so the gap is not great now what is in the mind of these three men obviously there's still 26 and a half 27 laps to go so there's plenty of racing ahead plenty of traffic to be passed I don't think you'll see any desperation move, but they all know that Michael Andretti could be the wild card guy because he's right in front. He's going to fight hard not to be lapped, and it's a question of how long it takes each of these men to make that move past Michael Andretti that could very well determine how things will shake out over the next, say, seven to eight minutes of racing. Rick is going to have the first shot at Michael. Ah, here we go, man. He won't. No, oh, that's the same move he tried last time. All right, he gets cut off. It's not Mears cutting him off, it's Ray Hall, I think, showing Mears, hey, I'm here. You know, and uh, I have some things on my mind, too. Uh, Ray Hall, remember, has never won the Indy 500. Rick Mears has won it twice, which gives him an enormous psychological advantage. But toward the end of last year, in the regular racing season, it was Ray Hall winning all the races. So if you delete the fact that this is the Indy 500, it's really Ray Hall that has made more trips to Winter Circle recently than Rick Mears. Well, the two of them are among, as we have pointed out, the calmest of all souls in this turbulent sport. If there's a man out there whose heart is really racing right now, you suspect it might be Ken. No, no, I don't think so. I think Kogan is the ice man, too. I mean, he goes out to his home there in Borrego Springs, where he's in California, where his nearest neighbor is a mile away. And what does he do? He shoots skeet right off the back deck, just sort of dripping with sweat in his shorts. You know, he loves that kind of thing, and he loves this kind of thing. Oh, I think Kevin has in the last few years matured enormously and is just as rock solid out there uh, behind the wheel as either of the two adversaries that he sees in front of him. Meantime, he's studying their form. It's Kevin that really has the best opportunity to see uh, the handling of the other two cars that he's going to have to beat and to decide what to do about it. Interesting irony to have Michael Andretti suddenly thrust into this spoilers role, if in fact that's what it is. Uh, Michael, who of course, what now seems like Jim so long ago when he led the race so confidently and easily in the early going. But his team has not dialed him up the ideal combination right at this point, and so he is straining to stay ahead. Four fastest cars on the track all together. Chris Bowen, watching, waiting, worrying, and wishing. We're great here. Yeah. Terrific what you asked was the closest Indianapolis 500 in history. Well, if you were with us through the long rain delay last Sunday, you know that it was the 1982 finish in which Rick Mears chased Gordon Johncock to the checkered flag and lost by 16 one hundredths of a second. That is about the size of Mears' margin over Bobby Rahal right now. Lap speed, 199 miles an hour for Rick Mears. That's been close to the speed they've run on a clear track like this. Mears had one speed of 205, but at that point uh, he had slipstreamed uh, another car, drafted another car back down the uh, back straightaway. There's Debbie Rahal. She, with the confidence that her husband will win this race, they uh, have a daughter now they didn't have a year ago, Michaela. Maybe the daughter will bring him some luck. To a certain degree, these pictures need no captions. The drama is quite clear. Rick Mears, Bobby Rahal, Kevin Kogan and all the people who work with them trying to win the Indianapolis 500. We'll be back. At Midas, we've always been proud of the job we do. A lot of our new customers are referred to us by our old ones. Howdy, boy. Welcome back, Mr. Creedy. You see, good service, good prices. The word gets around. Like our fantastic anniversary sale. We're giving you 25% off every Midas muffler. A sale like this doesn't come along every day. Take it to Midas. I love a sale. Take it to someone you trust. 
This is a full-size Chevy. That's a full-sized Ford. That Ford's got a six. This Chevy is equipped with a V8. But did you know that Ford six is priced $147 more than this Chevy with a V8? So ask yourself, would you rather have the Ford or the Chevy? Simple. Unless you don't care about money. Get low 6.9 financing on all new full-size Chevy pickups. Length of finance contract is limited. Indianapolis 500, only 12 men who sat on the pole at the beginning of the race have won it. Rick Mears was one of them back in 1979. The last to do it was Bobby Unser in 1981. Now Mears stands to do it for a second time in his career if he can hold on. He is the leader. You see his yellow car right there on the left of the screen. You can also graphically see the margin over Bobby Rayall in second place, Kevin Kogan in third place. No change since we went away for that commercial. And maybe the margin is widening just a tiny bit though it's almost imperceptible. Well, actually, what I think's happening is that Michael Andretti is pulling ever so slightly away from Rick Mears. In other words, arguably, Michael is now, even though he's in dire risk and danger of being lapped, uh, notice Kevin Kogan taking that extremely high line once again, and that uh, blue car enabled him to put that pass on Rick Mears earlier. Uh, the speed, 198.7 for Rick Mears on that last lap. But Michael Andretti may not be going to play the spoiler role. He may stay just tantalizingly out of reach, and it may just be a three-car race among the three that you see right here. Sam, if we can do so without detracting from the drama, you see Michael Andretti in front, in the yellow car, Rick Mears, in the red car, Bobby Rahal, in the blue and white car, Kevin Kogan, at this point, 17 laps to go in the race. If we can touch on this without distracting too much from the drama, a factor which may or may not mean anything here, physical stamina, athleticism, the strength involved in driving one of these cars 500 miles. It's been measured that driving a car like this, and I think we got a little feel of that when we, from the uh, race camp, is about the equivalent of chopping wood. Isn't that, that funny? But, uh, of course, your heart rate is uh, very high, uh, maybe double or two and a half times what it would be at rest, simply because of the excitement. I mean, it's not excitement, gee whiz, it's excitement you've got to cope with so many different kinds of things going on simultaneously. 15 laps to go, being shown Rick Mears, less than a second back, being shown to Bobby Rahal. So, uh, obviously, we're coming into it right now. To try to analyze the strengths and weaknesses of the three men, Rick Mears really has driven the race to the point uh, where he is wh where he wants to be. Uh, he's leading. He's got the best setup that he's had on his car all month on the car now. He is, at this point, at least able to stay even with his two pursuers. Kevin Kogan running in third is the biggest contrast. His car is running so much higher in the groove. Good place if he needs to make a desperation overtaking attempt. Kevin Kogan may have an ace that the other guys will not have. We're now going to see how they do in traffic, and that's where Kevin's ability to pass on the outside could be a factor. Bobby Rahal, I don't know what aces he may think he holds at this stage. One ace he holds is he's closer to Rick Mears than uh, Kevin Kogan. All right, now Mears has a car in front of him and is trying to get by. That is probably the rookie Whoa. Randy Lanier. There goes Ray Hall. He's going to get by on the inside. Bobby Ray Hall has gone by Rick Mears and now taken the lead in the Indianapolis 500. The crowd erupts as Ray Hall carries the lead in the traffic. And now Kogan moves up on Mears' outside right field. That was the traffic.
Kubrick, no question, it was Lanier's presence blocking Ray Hall momentarily, uh, blocking Mears momentarily that gave Ray Hall his opportunity. There goes Kogan. He's going to try to get by Ray Hall. Kogan. And he's got him. Yes. Yes, Kevin Kogan is in the lead. Ray Hall faded surprisingly up against the turn, the wall in turn one, left it wide open. Don't let the car on the right of your screen confuse you. That is still rookie Randy Lanier right behind him. That is Kevin Kogan in the blue and white car. Now the leader in the Indianapolis 500. He's going to try to put Lanier between himself and the other two, and he just did it. Now Kogan has a golden opportunity with 13 laps to go to charge out to a lead. This would be redemption of the highest order for a superbly talented young race car driver whose career might have been shattered by the events of 1982 here on this field. He had too much determination for that. It might have been shattered by his broken legs and feet. He had too much determination for that. Remember that Kevin Kogan won the season opener this year at Phoenix, uh, and that has given him and his whole team enormous confidence. You see him pouring it on almost now as if he merely waited to make his move uh, for the right time. And the minute he saw a clear ground in front of him, he went for it. This is a sudden and striking move. It was shocking at that moment to see Ray Hall go by Mears so easily. It was much more shocking to see Kevin Kogan blithely go past the two of them. And it is surprising to me to see Mears now unable to fight back. Uh, what is going on in Mears' mind? Is he really rattled at this point? He's got a slower car between him and even second place, still represented after the shuffle by Bobby Rahal. Rahal led momentarily only to be blown aside by Kevin Kogan, who surged third into the lead in less than a lap. Roger Penske has fired a lot of drivers during his turbulent and brilliant career as a car owner. One of the men he fired is the man in car number seven, Kevin Kogan. It would be his revenge, would it not? There, is a lot of, there are a lot of stories like that inside the world of racing, which is necessarily a very small world because there are so few men that can perform under the situations of pressure just like this. Let's have a look at the move that put Kevin Kogan into the lead. You see him on the right of your screen in the blue and white Pat Patrick car. That's a large car. And you see Bobby Rahal in the center in the red car. All right, this is, they've just crossed the start finish line. That's Randy Lanier. They're lapping him on the left. He's driven quite a good race. And it's Lanier that, in effect, makes Ray Hall feel he has to back out of that turn. Uh, he cuts down, slowing Ray Hall right up and letting Kogan go ahead. Indeed, wow. Lanier was a key figure in the entire sequence. When they first approached Lanier, Mears was the leader, Ray Hall was in second place, and Kogan was third. By the time they had finally disengaged themselves from Randy Lanier, the order had been completely jumped. Exactly. Kogan, Ray Hall, Mears. Exactly so, but Lanier, just as we're talking about it, drove superbly, kept his head, and did exactly what you're supposed to do. Look at this lead, Jim, with nine laps to lead to, to go. Kevin Kogan is going to be very, very hard to catch all of a sudden. Although, still there are plenty of cars in the race, more than typically are in the race at this point. Kevin Kogan, you saw the back of his car fishtailing slightly. He is running on the limit. No, that's good. He is almost hitting the wall. He is driving on the extreme limit in order to pull out this lead. I mean, I think you're seeing the maximum possible effort he can make. The car might be pushing just a little bit. He is certainly been on a high line all day long and you wonder now if he's going to be able to get through all those turns again look at how high he is in that groove i mean look he almost slides this is maybe the moment where kevin kogan will come the closest he's going to come to losing the indianapolis 500 he was very very lucky to get away with it and jim it's not pushing the whole car is sliding if anything the back end of the car is a little bit loose if he was pushing you'd see him running a shallower line down across the lines on the inside so he's driving the kind of car that, that's set up the way you qualify, which is very, very uh, close to spinning out. They say uh, this year that the cars go from being very stable to a point where they just snap into a spin, and I think Kevin's car is set up very close to that right now. All right, all three leaders have completed 192 laps. There are eight laps, 20 miles to go in the Indianapolis 500. Seven left to go when he crosses the start-finish line here. Michael Andretti just ducking in, incidentally. Fourth place, Michael Andretti. That's Ray Hall right behind Kogan. Yep. Here comes Mears. He may still have three 
cars who have a say about this. We knew Michael was going to probably have to make that extra stop. He's making that now. That, of course, is totally the end of any chance. He will now be lapped. He has been yeah, lapped. He's good. But look at how close Bobby Rahal now is to Kevin Kogan. Kogan, driving that hard, may have superheated his tires a little bit. He may now be relatively defenseless uh, to a charge by Bobby Rahal. Kevin Kogan on the left of your screen in the lead as they come out of turn four. He faces the front straight. When he passes the start-finish line now, there will be six laps to go. So you can count them down as you watch with us the duel between Kevin Kogan and Bobby Rahal with Rick Mears still working and hoping that something can fall into his lap. Yeah. Uh, of course, Ray Hall has to get close. We've got to look ahead to see what traffic. They're in the short shoot now. Now they're in turn three. Kevin Kogan still running awfully close to that wall. I'll tell you, to maintain the speed, which is exactly 200 miles an hour per lap at this stage, about 220 on the straight, a crash. Hey, Ari Lyondike will come out. Lyondike, and there will be a yellow flag punching them. And, and if the Kevin yellow could win the race yes, under, the yellow. under the yellow. Although, well, I don't know. That was Lyondike crashing just off turn four. Boy, oh boy, it could be settled under the yellow. You are not wrong, Jim Lampley. I'm happy yep. to hear that. <laughs> oh, well, that's uh, quite a point. Yeah, All it's right. entirely possible, depending on the length of the yellow flag. And <laughs> Kevin Kogan may have just received the greatest break of his racing life. Five laps to go. He had established the lead and was trying to hold it when the car went awry, as you saw on the screen, and the yellow is now out. The crowd will now wait expectantly and count laps, <laughs> as will every driver on the course, and particularly those three, Kevin Kogan, Bobby Rahal, and Rick Mears. Here's the crash of Ari Leyendijk. I believe I made that the right call. All right, he spins coming off of the fourth turn, and as so many of the drivers have uh, today, he's able to stay off of the outside wall, which gives the car a much longer time to slow down. This is not a crash of the magnitude, say, of uh, Mario Andretti's in practice. In fact, if he tags the wall at all, and I guess he now slides back into it, uh, now how long will it take them to clean this up? No race organizing body likes to have a major race or any race end under the yellow. They like it to end under the green with the men racing, obviously. I would suppose that there will be a great effort made to get Leyendijk's car out of the way uh, as quickly as possible. My guess is we'll see a couple of laps of racing under the green. What do you think? Well, if that's the case, and I think it will be, this is a tremendous break for Ray Hall and Mears, who will now get to chase Kevin Kogan from very short range. Can you imagine what Kevin is feeling now? He put everything into those efforts. Four laps to go now. Let's have another look at that crash. R.A. Leyendijk, I think the only, the first Dutchman ever to make it into this race. We'll see him in turn four. Kept uh, it off the outside wall, as you said. Almost yeah. everybody has going back to Steve on the pace lap. Yeah, exactly. Leyendijk, rookie of the year last year. Everybody realizes if you can keep him off the outside wall, your chances of survival are about 100%. Uh, in fact, he handles that beautifully. Um, I know it sounds ironic when you see the car just whipping around like that, but look, it hardly tapped the wall. Well, so, now he was inside the confines of pit row. It seems to me, without knowing as much about it as you do, Sam, that they ought to be able to clear that away in time to allow some racing under the green. Well, I agree. I don't think he was quite inside the confines, but the fact that the car wasn't damaged means it can be quickly pushed aside. You see what I mean? If the suspension had been deranged and they had to get a wrecker out, that would have been different. Well, I was going to say about Kevin, though, imagine I mean, he put everything, his heart, into that. All right. All right, Sam Posey is now going to get a chance to converse briefly with Kevin Kogan. <laughs> Kevin, this is Sam Posey. Uh, your thoughts right now. I didn't hear you. Kevin, this is Sam Posey. Your thoughts now with just three laps to go. Kevin, that's uh, Sam Posey on the radio trying to talk to you. I'm kind of busy right now, Sam. I'll talk to you afterwards. 
Fair enough, and good luck to you. He is indeed rather busy right now. Let's clearly point out that these conversations with the drivers during yellow flag periods only have been cleared in advance with pit crews. You heard the crew member telling Kevin Kogan there that that was Sam Posey trying to talk to him. And, of course, Kevin, quite understandably, would like to focus on the business at hand. Well, I think it underlines the pressure that he's under. Uh, frankly, I wouldn't have wanted to, to talk to me either, if you know what I mean, at this point. I mean, I believe he put everything that he had into that effort to get away from his two pursuers. Now, he may have, of course, been able to cool the tires down, uh, and there'll be, be a little bit better grip uh, if, he ha if it does go green. Well, he's got no problem if they don't go green. He's going to win the race under the yellow. But I have to assume that Kevin is sitting there thinking, OK, we're going to get two laps of green flag. And he is trying to anticipate precisely how and where Ray Hall is going to come at him and how and where Mears might come at him. We are now being told that they are going to go green the next time around, and there will be two laps to go at that point. So we're going to see a two-lap race to the flag between Kevin Kogan, Bobby Rahal, and Rick Mears, and what we are seeing, quite frankly, is one of the most dramatic races in the 70-race history of the Indianapolis 500. Sure, because how often do you see three cars in contention? Two, yes, even that, rarely, but three, never. This is fabulous. Kevin Kogan in car number seven, the blue and white, in case you just joined us. The crowd standing and cheering all three of them, and indeed every car left on the racetrack. Hundreds of thousands of people now up and ready to watch on their tiptoes as they go green and race for two laps. The Indianapolis 500 is now the Indianapolis 5 between Kevin Kogan and Bobby Rahal and Rick Mead. Oh, and Kevin didn't get the start he might have hoped for. And Ray Hall's going by him. Bobby Ray Hall in car number three has the lead once again. You look at Debbie. She knows what's happened. They come out of turn two. They're going down into turn two now. Down the back stretch. Ray Hall trying to stretch the lead over Kogan. Deer's trying to get into it. I think it was a disadvantage for Kevin to be leading because it allowed Ray Hall to sit back just slightly and time the start. In fact, here comes Rick Mears. Can't get by him. They're in turn three. Now they're in turn four. And they'll come out of turn four and onto the front straight. There will be one lap to go now when Bobby Rahal comes by the start finish line. 33-year-old Bobby Rahal of Dublin, Ohio, trying to beat 30-year-old Kevin Kogan. And right now, Debbie Rahal believes it's about to happen. They're in the turn one. Looks good. Short short two. He's got it. He's got it in the car. He just ran a lap at 204 miles an hour, so he had something left and he's showing it right now. And Rick Mears may be going to menace Kevin Kogan for second as Ray Hall goes on to win. That's a possibility. The yellow flag, which appears to have won the race for Kevin Kogan, instead created an opportunity for Bobby Ray Hall to win it. An opportunity that Ray Hall has taken advantage of. There in front of him, on the right, now the left, Dwayne Sweeney holds a checkered flag for the 1986 Indianapolis 500 champion, Bobby Ray Hall. Well, one of the, there's Debbie. Fantastic. Easily one of the greatest 500s we've ever seen. Kogan, driving one of the greatest races of his career, has just finished second in the Indianapolis 500, and I guarantee you that that is a very empty second place at this moment. Yeah. Maybe it'll feel good sometime later tonight. I doubt right it. Now. No, not, not having come that close. He'll regard that as nothing but a uh, defeat, basically. Crushing. I really feel for him. Without the yellow, there's no doubt whatsoever Kevin had earned this race. That's exactly how Debbie Rahal reacted at the moment that her husband took a checkered flag almost directly in front of her because the Rahal pit was in the middle of pit road. This is great for a man named Jim Truman, 51 years old last week, currently battling an illness. Tremendous thrill for him. His car, driven by Bobby Rahal, has won this race. He's battling cancer, and it's got a real grip on him. So this really means an incredible amount, I think, to this 
team which was created four years ago with the objective of winning the Indy 500, and they have done it. They're a very close team. You would imagine that Ray Hall's thoughts have already gone to Jim Truman from this moment. Final standings, Ray Hall first, Kevin Kogan second, third place, Rick Mears, fourth place, went to car number five and Roberto Guerrero, and right now, let's go to Jackaroo. Well, as the new stand, as the new stand goes up here, Bobby Ray Hall is getting the congratulations of his crew, getting unhooked, as you can see, from inside his machine. He's getting out, Debbie, while he's getting on, congratulations to the both of you. Get your helmet off. This is Debbie Ray Hall. Debbie, congratulations. Thank you very much for those golden moments that you can't play in five foot three. Indeed, indeed. We're going up in the air. Bobby is going, getting his helmet off now. It takes a little longer than he probably would have if he hadn't won. And Bobby, here it is. The crew, crowd can now hear. They're congratulating. A kiss from Debbie Ray Hall. Bobby, fantastic. Unbelievable. Great finish. I'm almost uh, in tears. This one's for Jim Truman. Indeed it is. A oh, man. I'm coming, but uh, the car ran beautifully. The crew did a great job. Thank you, Budweiser. Uh, that's the one thing I can give Jim Truman. It's this. Most importantly, for those of you that don't know, Jim Truman, Bobby, gave you your first start in auto racing, your first professional start. You've stayed with him all the way through. Did you ever have a doubt that it would be you and Jim Truman in the Indianapolis 500? No, because he's the highest quality human being, and I knew that uh, my great days would come with him. Awfully quiet all month. Nobody wrote that much about Bobby Ray Hall. Were you just sitting pretty, just hanging in there, knowing that you're going to be there? No. <laughs> when we started the race, I really didn't know what to expect. <laughs> but the car ran really well all day. We hardly made a change at all. And um, just, uh, I got a good restart there. If it hadn't been for that yellow, I would have been struggling. And, uh, and here he is. Here's the moment everyone's waited for. Jim Truman getting the... Couldn't have been better. Yours. Couldn't have been better. Let's get a word with Jim. Jim, the milk, symptomatic of victory of the Indianapolis 500. He takes it as his driver did. Congratulations, Jim Truman, Indy 500 champion. Thank you very much. It was, uh, it looked like when a caution came out, we were dead. He just got a hell of a restart and walked away. And I, best race of his life. Fantastic race. Unbelievable. Let's go back upstairs. Very grave possibility exists that Jim Truman won't be here next year. It's great to see him standing there. Sam, let's take a look back at the moment which really decided the race, which was the dropping of the green flag. Kevin Kogan approaching the start-finish line. There goes Rahal. Yeah, and you can see that Kevin's uh, position in many ways was a liability because Bobby had timed the start perfectly, as you often can when you're behind the leader rather than obliged to be the leader. That's all it was. It wasn't a pass in the conventional sense in a corner or anything like that. Uh, he just had momentum at the time that the green came out. In other words, the Indy 500 has come down to the fact that he timed the moment that he planted his foot on that accelerator and he timed it just exactly right. As I said, it isn't a conventional pass. It's just the moment he pulled around it. Wow. That was it. And that settled the Indianapolis 500, which had become at that moment the Indianapolis 5. Five-mile race to the finish after a yellow flag between Bobby Rahal, Kevin Kogan, and Rick Mears, won by the man we just saw there on the screen, 33-year-old Bobby Rahal of Dublin, Ohio. No additives or preservatives. Purity you can see, quality you can taste. Miller's made the American way. When Carol Black put new Goodyear Eagles on her Ford, her tires weren't the only things that changed. 
With Eagle GT Plus 4s, her car took off, stopped, and went around corners much better than it used to, even on wet, sloppy roads. And her car's appearance changed, as well as its performance. To someone like Carol, appearances aren't everything, of course, but they aren't nothing, either. When the big Q flows, America goes. Kogan is racing this year for his six different Indianapolis car team in a row in terms of six years. I think you found a home. Yeah, there's no question about it. This is a great team. The 7-Eleven cars, cars is really, you know, it's fantastic. And uh, the crew is the best. Engineers are the best. Kevin, is there any way that you can share with America what went through your mind when you came around there and saw that yellow flag with just five laps to go? Well, you know, it's lots of times there is an advantage to the guy behind if he does uh, get a jump on you. And, I thought I had the race handled uh, if it would stay green all day. My car was going loose with uh, empty loads. That's the way it had been all day long, though. So I was pretty much uh, in tune with it. I knew what it was going to do, and I was ready for it. But uh, it's just a shame it went yellow like that. The pass from Ray Hall, fair, just racing? Yeah, he just uh, he got the jump on me on the restart and uh, out horsepowered me down straight away, I guess. He just, he just beat me to the throttle, I guess. Kevin, you told me just before this interview that the car was kind of beating you to death at certain parts of the race, but you look pretty fresh right now. Did the last uh, 20 laps or so pump you up? Well, uh, the car was, I could, I could pretty much run with it in the middle. In other words, when it was full, it was a little push, and when it was empty, it was a little too loose for me. But in the middle, it was good, so that tend to be when I'd make my good moves. During that yellow flag when Sam Posey tried to tune into you, you explained to him, please excuse me, I'm busy. Can you give us an idea of what some of the thoughts were going through your mind? Were you plotting that start when you finally saw the green bunting? Well, you know, I just, I just didn't really want to talk at the time. I was uh, only a couple laps left, and, and at, US, at USAC's different than CART. They don't give you a one-lap-to-go sign here at start-finish, and so uh, I like to keep my eye on the... Usually I can tell by what the driver's doing as to when it's going to go green. So uh, you have to keep your eyes on him. After 1982 and everything that has been written and said... This has got to be a very warm and gratifying moment. Well, you know, it's a, it a huge disappointment for me because I, uh, I really wanted to win the race, and I think if the yellow flag hadn't come out, we would have won. I, you know, you can't uh, look back and cry over spilt milk, but uh, I sure wish the yellow hadn't come out. Kevin, the one moment where you took the lead, you used lap traffic. Did you have the boost turned all the way up there? And I assume that because of when the yellow flags came, the last 10 or 15 laps were boosted all the way. You know, strangely enough, I had to turn the boost a down a little because... Uh, they told me it was going to be close and that not not to pop off at all the uh, boost. So uh, just when they told me that in the last yellow, uh, my earpiece fell off. Not the last yellow, but the yellow before the last. So I ran the whole last series, you know, when I was behind Rick and Bobby, uh, with the boost down because I didn't know when I'd pop it off. It's a very delicate thing. So I had to turn it down slightly, and I didn't dare touch it after that. Well, second today, first earlier this year at Phoenix. He is the new points leader for 1986. Jim. You know, some people have speculated in recent years that the driver was becoming a less important part of a race car as the computers and the technicians and the scientists took over. Here was a day when all the science, all the computer technology balanced out evenly almost among three cars. And in the end, it was like an old trophy dash of years ago, a driver's race. And the driver was Bobby Rahal. The standings in a minute. I don't believe this book. Jocks and Lee Kellogg's Corn Flakes. New pages, huh? Number four on the car, number three on the line, of course, belonging to Rick Mears, who began today sitting on the pole at the Indianapolis 500. A lot of wear and tear on this car and an awful lot on the driver itself. Rick, it's amazing to me with all the things that can go wrong with a car that is able to perform up to expectation. At least it seems to. Did it let you down at all today? Well, not really. The car just, you know, never missed a beat all day as far as the running and all the mechanical gear and everything was just great. The guys did a super job on it. And got me in and out of the pits great, you know, really gained time all the time there. Uh, the only thing that did bother me was I didn't have the thing balanced very good for traffic, you know, and turbulence. I really I had, had a struggle in traffic. It was one of the most exciting finishes in Indianapolis history, but there was a tremendous amount of indecision as to whether they would go green, whether they would not. How did you approach it? What was your game plan when you finally saw the green flag? Well, we were just going to run as hard as we could, you know, that's all we could do. And... Uh, it was just going to be a matter of how we got to jump at the start uh, with the other two guys and what they ended up doing and as to, you know, whether we'd be able to get by one or two of them or not because the car, like I said, in traffic, I, I was having trouble. So if we didn't get a good shot on them, 
uh, right off the bat, we, we were going to have trouble doing it. Rick, you certainly were the muscle man this May in Indianapolis, and I know you'll be back. Thank well, you. Well, I can't complain. We had a good month. Okay. Jim McKay, back to you. Okay, a sporting interview from the man who finished third in this race, Rick Mears. Well, it's always nice when a young couple is building a nice house to know where the money's coming from. And Debbie Rahal did in this instant. She also knew that her husband would be there to enjoy it with her as the winner of the 1986 Indianapolis 500. Is she entitled to that? I should say so. And so it's going to be quite a night in the city of Columbus, Ohio, and in the nearby town of Dublin, Ohio, which now numbers amongst its citizens not only Jack Nicholas and Muirfield Village Golf Course, but Indianapolis champion Bobby Rahal, whose house is going to be right on the edge of that golf course. Let's take a look now at the standings, which will not be official until 8 o'clock tomorrow morning. That is the traditional way it is handled here at Indianapolis, but here is the story. Bobby Rahal, the winner, Kevin Cogan second, Rick Mears third, all those very close together on the same lap. Then Roberto Guerrero finishing a very strong fourth, Al Unser Jr. fifth, and Michael Andretti sixth. Running down further, Emerson for Fittipaldi, the former world driving champion, three-time uh, Indy winner, Johnny Rutherford, Danny Sullivan, last year's winner, Randy Lanier, uh, the rookie, Pettenhausen, that's Gary, and uh, the Brazilian, Bozell. Brabham, Dick Simon at 52, finishing 14th, and Lion Dyke, who crashed and was a factor in the late running of the race, Pancho Carter, Ed Pim, Jose La Garza of Mexico, uh, Moreno uh, of Brazil, another rookie, uh, Jacques Villeneuve of Canada, Chip Ganassi, Allen for senior there, A.J. Foyt finished 23rd, uh, Danny Ungaius, you saw. Uh, Vogler, Snyder, Johnny Parsons, Tony Bettenhausen, Jim Crawford of Scotland, Scott Brayton, and bringing up the rear, Phil Kroger, Mario Andretti, and Tom Sneva, two names you would not expect to find at the end of the pack. Yellow flag, seven, as you see. Laps under the yellow, 31. Lead changes, 19 of them. At average speed, 170.722. Easily a new track record by almost seven miles an hour. We'll be back. This live ABC Sports presentation of the 70th Indianapolis 500 is 